Dr. Joseph Buchstein, a research radiology professor emeritus at UC San Diego, was invited by the Democratic Club of Claremont to address how human population growth is the key issue behind global warming and potentially catastrophic climate change. Dr. Buchstein urged his audience to insist that elected leaders, environmentalists, and other public figures take up the issue of population reduction as the only viable means to reduce greenhouse gas emissions with any significant long-term impact. The following remarks are highlights from Dr. Buchstein's presentation. Inaction will bring further inhumane population decrease. We're going to have population decrease one way or the other. If nature does it, it's going to be awful and it'll be the end of civilization. So we should do it ourselves. Okay, so leadership must come from the more developed countries. This is a worldwide problem. Global warming requires a global cure. National population bureaus should be developed. And there's a, there's a Bill Ryerson in the United States is, is, is encouraging the development of a population bureau in the White House. And I think that's a good idea. And many other people do too. Population policies must be applied equally to all countries, races, and religions. We can't have one religion saying, we've been disproportionately persecuted, or our religion is too small. Everybody has to adopt uh, various guidelines pretty much equally. Otherwise, we'll get no place. They were studying data that went up to the year 2004. There were 49 gigatons of CO2 or other greenhouse gases called CO2 equivalents emitted that year. These are 1,500 of the foremost climatic uh, scientists in the world uh, formed this report. 49 gigatons, that's 49 billion tons. It's important to remember the size of this problem because when our um, governor talks about 300 million uh, tons being saved uh, by windmills or one thing or another. That is a drop in the bucket compared to 49 billion tons. 55% comes from the less developed countries and 45% from the more developed countries. And of, 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 the more, of the more developed countries, of course, we take the cake. We're far and away emitting more per person uh, than Canada, Australia, and the European countries. Well, we have a way of uh, analyzing some of these claims. And there's a lot of hype and hyperbole uh, and hope in these claims. Uh, but we have a method to dissect all that uh, stuff, and it's called arithmetic. So let's look at some of these uh, suggestions, some of these wedges. Um, number one and two deal with cars. And the first one is increased fuel economy of their two billion cars. Anticipate there'll be about two billion cars in the world uh, within 50 years. Increase the fuel economy by a factor of two. Let's see what that's, there's a lot of money going into that, a lot of emphasis. Let's see what that will do. How big a difference will that make? Okay, road vehicles produce two and a half billion tons of CO2 in 2004 by burning gasoline. The manufacture of that gasoline took more energy than is released by burning the gasoline. Production of that gasoline cost another th approximately three billion tons of CO2 equivalent. So to supply our automobiles in the world with gasoline, and the, the mileage that they produced. 5.5 uh, billion tons, but remember there's 49 billion tons per year. So that's about 11% of global greenhouse gases, okay? If the mileage per gallon doubled, you would decrease the amount of CO2 by two, two decrease it to 5.5% of global greenhouse gas emissions. 1 20th, that make a 5% change in greenhouse gases for all this effort and that effort would be nullified in five years by population growth. In summary, it is extremely unlikely that technology alone can significantly mitigate global warming. Extremely unlikely. Technological developments are unproven, they're expensive, and the development is time consuming. We don't have time. This is uh, an, an urgent 
situation. So it is time to look at the other side of the coin. What about population? Technology for population restraint is readily available and inexpensive. And the only thing we need is the political will. And if electric cars are used, and everybody's making a big fuss about electric cars, but if the electricity is derived from coal, then it's practically a wash, because coal is such a polluting uh, fuel to generate electricity with. So we have to get the TFR down to really 1.85, and then we can have a long, slow reduction in world population down to about 2.3 billion. And I and, and a number of other people think that 2.3 billion is a comfortable, sustainable population level for the world. That's down by two-thirds from where we are now. This, this reduction in population is slow, and we don't have much time. So how can we, how can we get the population down faster? If we were able to uh, have a, start a TFR program of one globally, this is just a target. Then we would reduce population quite rapidly, and by the year 2060 or 2070, we'd be down to about 4 billion in the world. And that's about as fast as we can go. And then after, when, you know, when we got down to 2 billion, then we could pick up to a maintenance rate of about 2.1 uh, children per woman. So that's about as fast as we can do. If we reduce TFR to 1, we can reduce world population in about 50 years to about 4.4 billion. Okay, so what would that do to world temperatures? If we have business as usual, change in CO2 equivalent emissions by 2058, about 50 years from now, will be about more than 100% greater than they are now per year. And the maximum CO2 concentrations will go up, say, around 700 to 800 parts per million. They're 386 now. And the temperature will go up 4.1 to, say, 5.3, the best estimate, degrees centigrade. That's, that's uh, like 1.8 times that is degrees Fahrenheit. Notice we've only gone up 0.8 degrees centigrade so far, and there's hell going on all over the world. And so we raise the temperatures another 5 degrees centigrade. There's no telling what's going to happen. It's, so there are a number of people who think will be the end of our civilizations with a few people living at the poles where it's dark six months of the year. I think we can motivate people. The problem is that there's not much money in being child free. This is contrary to the American mystique of growth. Growth in homes, growth in cars. We want more people. That's the way capitalism works on a growth format. And we're going to have to change our way of thinking. Some other specific humane population policies. Um, encourage a one-child family for the near future. I say encourage a one-child. Show what a one-child policy will do to, for global warming. Uh, eliminate pronatal tax incentives beyond the first child. There's a lot of things we can do. Inaction will bring further inhumane population decrease. We're going to have population decrease one way or the other. If nature does it, it's going to be awful, and it'll be the end of civilization. To find out more about how you can make a difference, please contact Californians for Population Stabilization by going to www.capsweb.org.